Um, so yeah, I've already introduced myself, but I was going through the code of conduct now. And just as I was saying, um, if you have anything that happens to you, please contact um, the people that you see on the screen. So with that, um, this is the agenda for today. We're slightly behind time, but I think it should be okay. Um, I'm without further ado, I'm just gonna give it to, uh, give it away to Kirsty. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, really excited to sort of have, have the discussions that today, um, we wanted to have an element of these community fora be a bit of a sort of celebration element. And also one of the things that we've noted is that navigating the Turing way can be quite difficult because it's so big and it's got so many facets and it sort of tries to kind of um, solve so many big structural challenges. And, and um, one of the elements that I had communicated before I went on maternity leave internally at the Turing Institute, I'd written up in a HackMD, how I link my reading of Adrian Marie Brown's book, Emergent Strategy, to the leadership of the Turing Way. And uh, I wrote that and then I left. <laughs> I left it, it uh, just sort of hanging there. And Malvika, the wonderful Malvika Sharon, uh, merged it into the Turing Way in our foreword, in our um, history section. section. Yes. Um, and so uh, let me just share my screen because I wanted to sort of show you where you can find it. And uh, so if I scroll up to the top here, so you can find in the foreword, emergence as strategy. And um, here you can see an illustration that we had uh, thinking about sort of leadership and how leadership can grow as part of sort of empowering as many people as possible. Um, I've written here that the Turing Way is a living book and um, I dig into each principle of Adrian Marie Brown's uh, emergent strategy. And these are they, these are the nine principles of emergent strategy. Um, there is a blog post that gives an overview of the book and I really encourage you to have a look at the book. Um, and what I want to do is set you all up to go into breakout rooms to have a discussion about um, whether there are any uh, principles that particularly resonate with you. So I'm gonna very quickly just scroll through and show you, uh, I'm not gonna read the whole chapter to you, that'd be ridiculous. I'm gonna sort of highlight how I link each of those nine principles to the Turing way. So the first is small is good, small is all, the large is a reflection of the small. And so thinking about this here is if we do one good thing in the Turing way, that is how you start to build up such a really powerful uh, momentum for change. Change is constant, be like water, um, and the Turing Way is designed to be ever-evolving, and so we embrace this version-controlled workflow, and actually one of the, I think, the hardest things about the Turing Way is having people understand that it's okay to edit other people's words. I think that's something that's really radical, really revolutionary, and very, very powerful as a sort of culture that we work together to keep improving. Um, there's always enough time for the right work. There is a conversation in the room that only these people at this moment can have, find it. And so one of my great passions is unstructured spaces. And uh, I know from many, many uh, pieces of feedback that unstructured spaces are very intimidating and they can be very difficult for people. It can be hard to invite people in to unstructured spaces. And bringing people together for creative and inspiring open-ended conversations is really, really powerful as well. So there's a few thoughts from mine on, on there. Never a failure, always a lesson. That's a very sort of, you know, um, uh, I don't know, quite a sort of common assessment for leadership that we are always learning and nothing that we do are, is, is wrong. We're just always in a pathway to kind of improving. Uh, trust the people. If you trust the people, they become trustworthy. And I think that's something that's really, really interesting. And it's a, it's a flip of an ancient Chinese scholar who wrote, if you don't trust people, you make them untrustworthy. And so undoing some of that is really powerful for building an inclusive space. Move at the speed of trust um, means that we uh, need to be sort of 
understanding the fact that we are not all of us, but some of us are volunteers to this space. We all have lots of other um, sort of draws on our time and on our energy and making sure that we are building together in a trustworthy and inclusive space requires time and energy and effort to go into that. So moving at the speed of trust is more important than moving um, sort of based on an external productivity based timeline. Focus on critical connections more than critical mass. Build the resilience by building the relationships. So that's something that we've really focused on, that we don't set metrics of the number of people or the, the sort of the reach of the Turing way. We focus on building very deep and strong relationships and connections, and that relates super strongly to the principle of moving at the speed of trust. Less prep, more presence. For me, this is very similar to there's always time for the right work. So recognizing kind of what we can control and thinking about how we sort of build spaces to focus on the areas that are really important. And that relates super strongly to what you pay attention to grows. And that relates really, really sort of strongly to this idea of um, that which you measure becomes what you are measured against and so what you pay attention to and for me that's that's trust that's empowerment that's sort of sending out great people from our community feeling like they are leaders and can go and influence in their own personal and work spaces um, that's thriving is, uh, is what we care about so that's a little bit of a sort of whistle stop tour through each of those emergent strategy principles and because I am now the host, thank you again to Anne, um, who is actually on annual leave at the moment. Um, I'm going to create. I'm going to create three breakout rooms. I think so. Just a few small groups, and let everyone uh, spend. I'll just do. I think seven minutes to kind of have us try and catch up on time a little bit. Please have a look at the emergent strategy principles, and see if any of them resonate with you or not. And then we'll come back to the main room and it'll be really interesting for all of us to hear kind of which parts of those discussions um, you, you focused on. So I'm gonna create the rooms. Um, I think it's all going to be fine. I'm going to automatically close the rooms in seven minutes. Best of luck. Thank you for having those discussions. I am curious to hear from anyone that wants to share any thoughts that you had in the discussion. Yeah, uh, Suzanne and Andre and me, uh, we I think we mainly uh, shared our uh, like feeling about like how these principles uh, how pe many people would not agree with these principles as well but I think uh, we agree but like uh, we are sort of in a bubble and if we try this to apply it to outside then we will kind of hit a, a wall yeah that's so that's so fascinating that's awesome so do you have like a specific example? I know you were talking generally, but like, is there one particular kind of area that you could imagine this just like not working outside of the bubble? I think it's one of the barriers for entry that people have is I think it can look like you have to have deconstructed so much of the incentive structure that's in the wider world that it's almost it's almost hard to build that bridge across and people have to live in kind of two different worlds in a way that's not very helpful. So I think that's a great example. And I agree, I think like, it's funny, like the amount of time that it takes to change behavior is probably a much bigger problem than the amount of time it takes to learn a new skill, for example, um, or put the sort of investment into bringing people together. But mm -hmm. Any other any other thoughts we've had? That's a really, really interesting. Yeah, Andrea, do you have I, I am I am translating this like we, we were talking about how how we started with the little like the first principle and, and we were saying that uh having a same set of behaviors the same set of 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 uh of behavioral without a, without a 
taking care of who's in the room and like if if it's a larger scale of a scale helps you really to be consistent and coherent and uh, and and takes out a lot of energy mental energy to 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 have like different sets of behaviors and like like this political uh, extra layer uh, and and I relate also uh, to bringing this to other spaces. So, for example, at at at, at uh, work or, or something like that. And when you mentioned the culture, I I think this is where onboarding is super key because it's very difficult to change a culture that is already super in place. But but a good onboarding, like a good bringing people and already setting up like the rules and i think this is something that is very successful at the turing way like like the onboarding is already setting this kind of principle so the person is already primed to be in this state of mind that not every space does so yeah basically no so yeah it's really i i also i think i'm i think i'm reflecting as well listening to you that like actually the principle of move at the speed of trust is so important and if you go back to sort of Susanna and Dimitri's examples that speed of trust might be super slow like super you know like a really long time horizon and I think one of the things that I would reflect on is kind of being like just showing up and continuing to have conversations but at a really slow sort of like long time frame is is one of the ways in which one could or we could change the world. Um, and then, yeah, and then being able to sort of think what I heard you say, Andrea, is like where you can sort of get people early <laughs> and set a culture as quickly as possible is is really powerful because it doesn't allow, it doesn't sort of entrench a status quo that's difficult to change. Just Any, yeah, mind, Susanna, yeah. We've got, uh... One more minute according to the agenda, but maybe we can have two or three more minutes. Yeah, that's great. Maybe if does anyone else have any other reflections that they that they had from the discussions? I might say something. Um yeah. yeah uh we spoke quite a bit about uh number three so there's always enough time for the right work um this will be my, me putting my spin on a bit but I, I sort of found that slightly more challenging point because i think it it sort of clashes a bit with uh i feel like often you've got your sort of own internal prioritization so you you're in the mindset of I want to achieve a certain thing. What's the best way I can go about it? Um, whereas I think this is more like saying, I have these resources and this much time. What's the absolute best thing I can do, whether or not it's what I had planned yesterday was was the most important thing. Um, and I think like sometimes I do a bit of a mix of those things, but it almost sounds a bit like a sort of trap I think I've gone to sometimes where you just sort of you do the work that's immediately in front of you and, and don't have a good sort of long-term oversight of what's going on um but we talk a bit, a bit about that and how it sort of relates to working with other people and sort of embracing what's what's around you and uh we went on then to speak, speak about um number seven so critical connections and how that's sort of related that there's a difference between it's not about getting the most collaborators it's a bit more about getting people genuinely engaged and um yeah people that are sort of really deeply involved are sort of more valuable and and spending your time helping people and enabling many people to do work is time better spent than just sort of working away on your own Yeah, thank you so much for those. I think um the <clears throat> I think the um the one the principle of there's always enough time for the right work is a really interesting one to confront. I always feel like that's that's not necessarily how most of us sort of like 
live in our days like usually you're doing the thing that's right in front of you or the short thing or like whatever it is and I think that reflecting on that principle is super and trying to sort of create spaces that allows it to be true is a really interesting one for me thank you everyone for having that conversation thank you in absentia to Malvika for um putting these principles and putting my writing up uh, as they say <laughs> if you think anything is not clear or you think they should be changed or adapted or improved in any way please open a pull request to suggest them or open an issue if you're not sure exactly what the changes should be um really sort of keen to keep those keep those sort of living and going forwards but Susanna would you like to take yeah. us take us forwards all right so yeah thank you that was really interesting so we're gonna swiftly move uh, to the conversation that Ariel wants to talk about the, or will be talking about the code of conduct. Um, I also realized that there's a few slides, uh, six, seven and eight uh, that we haven't touched on, but I will get back to those, I think, after we do the code of conduct. Um, so, because I, I think it links better with the next section. So give the floor to you, Ariel. Yeah, thank you very much, Susanna. Um, and I'm resharing the Framapad because again, uh, we'd like to start this uh, section with a bit of a uh, bit of interaction, but you won't have to talk to each other. Um, although please do if you feel like it. Uh, but we'd like to direct your attention down to line 98. Um, and this is a code of conduct discussion notes. Um, and we have a, an opening question, which is what does the code of conduct mean for you? in this community space as the Turing way. You can either attribute to yourself or not, if you would like to um, open up the Framapad in um, an incognito window, um, your response will come through as anonymous. Um, we're just interested in getting uh, reflections and feedback on that question. So that's what does the code of conduct mean to you in this community space um, on line from line 98 in the Framapad? Do you want to have like a few minutes of just silence yeah. and then a few minutes of silence and reflection um, to add, have people add stuff in? Okay. We'll just give it one more minute if you want to add any thoughts and reflections on that as well. Thank you very much, everyone who is adding their notes in there.
Okay. Uh, does anyone want to share out a little more about their reflection uh, in the hack in the uh, shared notes document? Otherwise, I'll give a bit of a summary of what people have added in there. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands up, but please do. This is this is allowed to be interactive. Please do feel free to share either in the chat or by putting your hands up. Um, so we have uh, some thoughts around keeping the, like defining the space as a safe one for people, having culture and expectations set, um, setting it up as an inclusive space with ways to hold people accountable. Um, feels like there's some guardrails so that people are mistreated or subject to harm from other community members. Again, put expectations around how to engage in the community um, before you even go ahead and start contributing. Um, developing common and shared understanding, shared values, um, and also critically knowing there's a process to resolve problems or get feedback if somebody's uncomfortable and that there's actually, there's not just expected behaviours, but a pathway for when people want to, for when people feel that the behaviours are straight outside the boundaries of what's acceptable uh, in the shared culture that we're creating in the Turing way. Thank you very much, everyone, for sharing your thoughts there. Um, and it's very important, codes of conduct are really important to create a positive and uh, uh, welcoming space and to proactively set cultural expectations um, around uh, the expected behaviours that we want to see in community spaces. Um, and the reason we're having this discussion today is because Malvika has been doing um, some work on uh, a pull request uh, that will go into the Turing Ways at a GitHub organizational level. So it will be applied across all the repositories that uh, demonstrate the outline specifically a guide on how the Turing Way is going to approach report handling. So if somebody makes a code of conduct report, how will the code of conduct committee as it stands approach dealing with that report? How will they speak to people that have had a report made about them? How will they speak, uh, speak to the people who are reporting code of conduct violations? Um, this detail was previously not articulated properly, uh, but it is now articulated in the pull request um, and will be reviewed and put into the code of conduct that's applied to all um, repositories soon. Um, I think one of the key things that we wanted to draw attention to um, in this meeting specifically is the concept that um, we have a scope for the code of conduct. So the, you know, the Turing Way is a wide reaching multi-dimensional community. Uh, lots of you are active in lots of other spaces as well. Um, and we recognize that there is a possibility that the way that you behave in the Turing Way space has an impact on your reputation or the Turing Way's reputation and the other culture of other spaces as well. Um, so one of the other things that we have done, that Malvika has done as part of uh, this update to the Code of Conduct is to define the scope of the Code of Conduct, where it actually applies. Um, and uh, I'm gonna copy this in. It's gonna be in Markdown, so it will be, um, will be a bit fuzzy in here. Oh no, and it won't let me do it in, in one go. Um, but you can also read this um, in the pull request as well, if it, you prefer. Um, so it's things, it, it's sort of bounding the Turing Way's application of the Code of Conduct to uh, our organized meetings. Um, if you are considered to be a community leader in the Turing Way, um, if you're taking on formal roles in the Turing way, um, and then also across our uh, communication and engagement platforms as well. So in spaces like Slack, or if we're interacting on Twitter or Mastodon or LinkedIn. Um, and we recognize that there will be events where the Turing way is not the main organizer, but is participating. There's likely to be a separate code of conduct for those meetings. In fact, there should be a separate code of conduct for those meetings that's clearly stated. And so that will apply in those cases as well, just to give a bit of a, a definition to a fuzzy boundary there. Um, 
And where we're thinking about um, the report being considered within the scope of the code of conduct, then we have uh, from line 129 in the pull request, we have uh, a manual on what we will do in terms of uh, reaching out to the reporter to ask for further information, um, to get a fuller picture of uh, the incident. Um, but critically as well, there may be times where the breach is considered outside of the scope of code of conduct, either because it's a community member existing in a different space or because it's considered too serious to be handled by a code of conduct committee at the at the Turing way. And in those cases, we do have now um, a step-by-step -step guide to what we're going to be doing with those um, to say that we will look at whether there's other authorities that need to be notified about the behavior if we consider it to be outside of the scope. So that could be somebody's behavior in a way that contravenes our code of conduct at a conference while they're not representing the Turing way, but we know that they contribute, for example, or somebody's done something that's very uh, quite severe and goes beyond what we define as norm setting, which is thinking about expected behaviors um, on sort of, a, I would call it a slight, maybe a slightly more moderate level rather than being um, in, like more severe. Um, and in all those cases, we will draft a transparency report uh, from the committee. And I keep saying we, that's a turn of phrase, Kirsty and Malvika are actually the Code of Conduct Committee at the moment. Um, for some reason, that's force of habit. Um, there's also a section as well, if you are interested, um, if the report is considered outside of the scope of Code of Conduct and the reportee is an employee of the Turing, as this project is based at the Turing and is predominantly funded, sort of the, the call, um, we have key delivery team members that are funded by the Turing. We have very specific policies at the Turing that guide this type of stuff. And in those cases where we feel it's outside of the scope of the code of conduct and the employee is an employee and the person is an employee of the Turing, there will be, we will follow those policies and processes. But those only apply if you are formal, if, if you have a formal employment for the Turing, but it's just making it clear about which policies and processes we'll be following in that case. Um, I'm going to pause here for questions. I do encourage everyone to have a look at that pull request and add your comments and thoughts. I think Malvika would be very pleased um, to receive feedback and perspectives. You can uh, see a few people have already commented in the past. Um, if you have. Uh, you know, strong feelings on anything, or you think that something is missing as well, please do say, basically. Um, but does anyone have any questions? Thank you for resharing that link, Kirsty, because it definitely got. <laughs> I I have a question. So the committee is Kirsty and Melvika, but <laughs> it says uh, the committee will escalate this issue to Kirsty. So it will just be like escalated within the committee. Um, Having me talk to myself <laughs> over here. Yeah, that's definitely something to catch. <laughs> yes. So uh, that uh, is currently doesn't make a lot of sense, but hopefully it will do in the future in the, we recognize that having Kirsty and Malvika, we do have an external um, ombudsperson um, who, who was appointed, and uh, that's Anna Cristali, who's over at Sheffield, who is independent, separate, can have things reported to them if you have concerns about relaying them back to Kirsty and uh, Kirsty and Malvika. But going forward, we, the project recognizes that there needs to be a, a wider and more diverse community uh, committee uh, for code of conduct. Uh, Kirsty. Yeah, I see. So I I just had a quick look at the specific context that Susanna's uh, pointing to. And there, the um, there's an important element that I have multiple roles. And so one of my roles is co-founder of the Turing Way, a founder of the Turing Way and co-lead of the Turing Way. And another of my roles is program director of the TPS program at the Turing Institute. And so actually 
I can sort of what what I think we need to what what I think we need to do is clarify that I would be acting in different like with a different scope. So so I actually to sort of slightly undo my like more facetious comments earlier. I actually can escalate to myself, right? I can be a member of a committee as part of the Turing way, and I can escalate information to myself. <laughs> in my role as program director for tools, practices and systems. And actually the other, the thing that's important about that and to sort of highlight to everyone here, and again, this might bring up questions if anyone has any, is that this relates really strongly to data management and data protection responsibilities, because what information the Code of Conduct Committee has and can consider is a super challenging area because and I think Ariel touched on it as well how you share information about behavior across organizations or across communities is 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 challenging and it's sort of to some extent it's important to do um otherwise you can have sort of serial harassers move from community to community to community. And if you've got no way of sharing that information responsibly, they can continue to perpetuate harm. On the other hand, someone may, you know, sort of violate a code of conduct in quite a, a relatively minor way, receive some feedback, change their behavior. But if that then is carried with them from community to community, you're really sort of, I think, probably overreacting and overstretching that um, enforcement. And so there's multiple sort of areas there. And, and I think one of the things that we need to do with this documentation is make the roles really, really clear. And folks also flagging in the chat that uh, Anna's email address might be out of date. So we will definitely make sure that that's a, an updated uh, section of the report. We've got um, one more minute. Great, yes, uh, okay, wonderful. So just to very quickly wrap up on this, as I mentioned, in the medium term future, uh, the plan is to have a expand recruit for an expanded code of conduct committee. Um, there is a section just down in the shared notes um, on line 112. Um, if people would like to share thoughts and ideas about what you would like to see incorporated as part of this process. So which particular groups you think might need to be involved? Do we want to have like specific representatives nominated? How how would you like that process? How would you like to see that process done? Aside from obviously transparently um, and uh, with clear guidelines. Um, and we're just sort of, it's a flag that we're going to be doing that update uh, soon and setting one up formally. And if anybody is particularly interested in, in getting involved and diving in, please also do signal that as well. Lovely, thank you. Um, so I think now we're going to take a five minute break. Um, and after that, we'll come back to hear from different um, working groups and what they've been up to. So I'm going to share my screen with a cuckoo timer for five minutes. Make sure you go at least stand up and stretch your legs a bit, uh, get some water. I'm going to go get some water um, and I'll see you in five minutes, which will be one minute past four.
Hope you got some water or some liquid. Um, and stretch your legs. And now we're going to move on to, I guess, the second slash last part of the community call. Um, I, as I said, Okay, so I'm actually wondering, because there is slide eight, uh, so I'll just share my screen uh, and then I'll give the floor to everyone else who's going to speak. I, th uh, I think we might be able to skip over uh, slides eight and nine. I think they were from an earlier yeah, one. I think we they, can just yeah. move on to the Okay, sounds group. good. Yeah. So in that case, Esther, do you want to share your screen or shall I share my screen and you can talk over it? Because you are the first one up. Are you there? No? Maybe we'll and come back. Yeah, indeed, for that it would be helpful if I'm back from the break. I hear you very far away. Awesome. Can you share? And in the meantime, I'll fix my audio. <laughs> no problem. Is that working? Okay. So I think we have about a bit less than five minutes uh per uh shout out so keep does it. this work yeah that's perfect Thank okay you. great then that makes a bit more sense all right so i'll keep it short um so i'll be giving a quick update of the book dash working group uh which uh, is not just me but it's also ariel uh, that's susanna as well uh carlos and Emma and I think that's all of us. Sorry if I've forgotten you, um, but I think it's just the five of us. Um, so I wanted to report on some successes, which is also partly not the book dash working group's work, but the planning committee's working um, uh, work. So I don't want to claim credit for all of that. Um, but apart from organizing the last successful book dash, uh, we also decided to update the application forms for the planning committee and the local hubs, uh, which ties into the call to action of this slide, actually. Uh, we've not only updated it, but the call to action is to actually apply to become a member of the planning committee uh, and or organize a local hub. Uh, and we for sure have uh, another Dutch and uh, London one for uh, the next round in November, which is, it sounds uh, wild to already discuss this in July, but it will be November very soon. Uh, we also have a GitHub repository now with issues. So our work is a lot more transparently organized, uh, which is great. Thanks so much, Ariel, who has done most of that work. Um, and we have also had some challenges that we needed to discuss as uh, part of the last book dash. Um, where there was some um, yeah, thoughts about the balance between new and existing community members and who should attend BookDash. Uh, and also for the BookDash documents that there's some streamlining needed uh, because people were uh, sometimes confused where they should go for information. Uh, and I think everyone found their way, but we will still take that feedback into account uh, and streamline some of the documents and make sure that we don't have all of the links everywhere. And I, I think I'll leave it at that in terms of time. So thank you. Lovely, thank you. Um, the next, sorry, I'm like juggling three screens and I'm muting myself. Um, <laughs> okay, I don't know who is, uh, no, yes, I do know. So Batul could not make it. Uh, she messaged me and the other person from the translation and localization group also could not make it. So she asked me to read this out loud. So I will. 
Um, so their successes have been that they have updated the localization chapter in the Turing way, uh, and they have submitted a grant application for the Digital Infrastructure Insights Fund. A uh, couple of sub challenges they've highlighted are multi deployment remains a challenge. I don't know what this means, um, but maybe this means this means something to someone else here. Um, and they say that they are restructuring the bi weekly co working call and that the co working call will now take place during the collaboration cafe with a monthly onboarding call for localization. Uh, they are celebrating that they will be presenting on multilingualism in open source and the Turing Way localization work at DWeb Camp. That sounds exciting. Organized in the Internet Archive from August 5th to the 11th in San Francisco. Wow, very nice. Um, and their call to action is Alicia Kroll and Batu are working on theory of change to identify outcomes and outputs from the localization group. And they will create a small survey to get feedback from the community in August. So I guess keep out an eye for that. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next uh, group, uh, which is infrastructure. Um, over to you, Jim. Thanks. Um, yeah, the, uh, the successes here are just me being vain because those are things I did during the book dash. Um, so you could, you can safely ignore those. Um, maybe I'll say a bit about, uh, I think was sort of what was referenced on the, uh, that slide. So our challenge, one of the challenges here is also think all support is difficult. And I, I think that's the, that might be the same as the multi-deployment issue um uh and that's something we've been talking about quite a bit i think the the really positive thing which is in the celebrations and the links at the bottom of this slide we've been having really good conversations uh particularly with rowan and angus who are working on miss md and the sort of next the future versions of jupiter book and something that's really nice and I think like quite flattering in a way is that they they considered the Turing Way an important user. And so the, it feels like they're putting quite a lot of effort to support us and, and what we want to do and, and make sure that the book builds and works. And, and so we've been expressing to them how having supporting multiple languages in a sensible user-friendly way is, is really important. So we've been talking a bit about how we can achieve that. And the, yeah, the answer is it's it's tricky, it's difficult. It might mean there's a different version, uh, sort of a different website for each language. It might mean that you coordinate them somehow by having some sort of shared uh, structure or truth between books, like maybe the table of contents is identical but the, the pages are different. Um, and so what we've been trying to emphasize is that we want a way to do this, which is manageable, which doesn't have the sort of restriction of saying there's one true language. So it, the book is English and then everything else is just a translation because that's not what we want. But also we don't, what we don't really want is multiple copies in different languages, which have no relation to each other. We do want this idea that there's a sort of a structure and, and there is there are contents of the books and, and you can sort of move between languages. Um, so, so that all seems to be going really well. So I wanted to share some of that and there, yeah, there are links here that you can look at. Uh, there's a build of the book in Miss and, and there's lots of really cool features to look forward to, I think, which should really appeal to us. Something they talk about quite a bit is um sort of linking up different bits of documentation so there's one thing that's really nice that you have these little tool tips which pop up and you can keep following which means if we link to other books or other guides that information will all sort of be there and, and visible and and easier to navigate so there will be much less 
feeling that we need to write everything ourselves and we can lean more on existing resources and other books and guides can also do do the same with us that sort of refer to to what we've done so i think that future looks looks really positive and and, and is all very exciting um the calls to action um i think roughly yeah get, get involved and talk to us and let us know what, what you'd like to see or what we can do to help people contribute to the book um maybe one particular thing which we've been meaning to do for a while and has slightly gone to the back burner is uh trying to break up the sort of giant mono repository that we had with um you know sorts of the book and different bits of notes and newsletters and then things um which i think is sensible and, and is completely doable but i think it needs just a bit of buy-in because there'll be a, a little bit of disruption when things which you might expect to be in the repository are sort of moved somewhere else um yes i think i think that's everything i have to say thank you i'm just reading in the chat um out loud that esther says in caps oh and ale i forgot ale for the book test working group so there you go it's uh, <laughs> it's read out loud now as well um thank you jim and i know that liz was going to present accessibility but she is not able to make it um so i don't know if someone else here uh can talk about this or shall i just read that loud um i'm happy to speak out speak out loud it'll be just the same as you doing it susanna basically but um these were added i think from um Anne lee Steele um a couple of days ago so um the couple of successes for the accessibility working group is um transitioning to from a pads like we've been using from hackmd they're more accessible for screen readers um, we've run a spy fireside chat on accessibility, which is really, really great. Um, and you can watch the fireside chat with the link down at the bottom there. Um, there's also a there's been merged an inclusive events chapter, uh, which was a lot of work across multiple different sort of communities, thinking about how to run events, um, particularly focused on bringing in people who are experts by lived experience and part of research projects. Um, but there's a lot more to sort of do around accessibility. Um, there is also a accessibility, accessibility policy that is open as a pull request, and we would love for you to have a look at that and give it any, any feedback. Um, there's some ongoing delays in reviewing the accessibility po policy and accessibility guide. So that's a, that's one of the challenges. Um, it's difficult to have sort of time committed for a volunteer led group. So that's something that's really important for us to kind of think about as a, as a community and how we make sure to not put more responsibility and burden on the people who are already, um, sort of experiencing, more challenging pathways in society. Um, the celebrations is that we are embedding accessibility in the project infrastructure and in the culture, which is super powerful. And there's launches of many new projects and initiatives. So events, policies, chapters, infrastructure. So that, that uh, momentum is really, really wonderful, potentially also linking into the challenges and the uh, successes as two sides of a, of a sort of similar coin. Um, and the call to action is to please continue to sort of stay as up to date as possible in terms of embedding access centered practices across our community. Um, and we are hoping to have a community led discussion around the location for the access related practices, probably in the next of these community forum, but maybe in a in a collaboration cafe coming up, thinking about whether it should be a new guide. So increasing our guides to six or whether accessibility sits within an existing guide. Um, there are pros and cons of both and other options. So keen to have as much input as possible from those. Lovely, thank you. Um, so with that, now we just have 
uh, any other business? Uh, what other topics should we cover in the next community forum, which you've already kind of uh, slightly touched on? I am wondering if we should keep this uh, written down in the frame of pad. Uh, we don't, for the, I don't know where in the open discussion, maybe from line 132. And obviously also just uh, talking about it. Um, I'm also not sure if you want to keep this recorded or if you want to stop recording now, it's up to you how you do it. So just keeping that in mind. I think it makes sense to um, keep it recorded, but if anyone has a point that they would like to not put their name to, please go ahead and add that in the frammer pad and one of us can read it out. So maybe just put a little note at the beginning of the bullet point and say anonymous or something like that, and we'll make sure not to not not to attribute it. You can um, also open the primer pad in incognito and then it shows as anonymous anyway. So, yeah. And I think we've got, I mean, thank you to whoever did it, of um, line 131, we now have a topic of open discussion for the next community forum. So uh, please, please do. Yeah, someone is putting in there, have the discussion about whether accessibility should be its own guide or embedded in existing guides in the community forum. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I think that's a good point as well. Follow up on discussion of the code of conduct committee recruitment proposal once that's written. I think that I think that would be, I mean, personally, my opinion. Uh, <laughs> that would be something nice to discuss with it in a community call. Susanna, could I ask a question about the code of conduct follow-up, the sort of style of code of conduct follow-up? Go for it, yeah. Yeah, so um, there's the, the way that we brought it up today is very sort of like policy level and an enforcement level, and that's super important. And we've got the pull request on that, and that's the sort of details aspect. There was a conversation that I had um, earlier this week that was highlighting that there's work to be done with the community around helping people to see um, sort of how they can engage with that policy. So a great big long written document is good and it's good for enforcement and it's good for kind of, you know, accountability and how we how we sort of follow through with the code of conduct but it's maybe not the most accessible for a sort of way of communicating what does it feel like to raise 
a code of conduct concern uh, or sort of potentially raise a code of conduct violation. And I'm curious to know if anyone here has thoughts on sort of maybe the best, like, alter not so additional ways of engaging the community around sort of supporting them to build up that those skills or that um, confidence rather than just say, hi, folks, here's a giant document written in Markdown as a policy. You mean that's in training someone to know how to handle a report of code of conduct or uh, to make? Oh, okay, to make it. Make, make. So the handle, I think the policy is, I mean, it, it's sort of necessary, but not sufficient for the making. But I think what the policy doesn't do is really help people to, well, I mean, maybe it does help people to see how they can make a report. And I guess I don't really mean logistically how they do it, because that's included in the in the document, in the code of conduct, but more sort of like, a feeling of empowerment that they that they can does am i making sense maybe i'm not making sense and that might be part of the <laughs> part of the challenge no i think that makes sense yeah i think maybe part of that discussion is when when do you make a report and um, because I, I think some people might feel that that could be snitching or whatever is going on is not severe enough to make a report. So maybe some questions of the like, yeah, question or discussion of if this is situation arises, do you feel comfortable to report? And if not, when would you do it? And uh, just some some discussion scenarios, I think, could be helpful. So I haven't read the code of contact entirely, but does it give examples of, I mean, I know there is the, uh, what is acceptable behavior and what is unacceptable behavior, but they're also quite like high level, like no racism, sexism, but like sometimes they can be quite like microaggressions. And so I wonder if there is a part in it where you give like specific examples of what a microaggression might look like. I don't know. I don't think we explicitly, I think that's a really great, I think that's a really great sort of um, suggested thing to look at. In the Code of Conduct, we do talk about um, expected behaviour. And so there's a section 2.1. So I'm just expanding the, the document. So there's, there's expected behaviour, be respectful of different viewpoints and experiences, use welcome and inclusive language, do not harass people, respect the privacy and safety of others, be considerate of others' participation and don't be a bystander. So those are quite broad. Um, and then there's some unacceptable behaviour, which is a bit more concrete. And I think um, it's sort of hard without specific example, like real world examples to kind of give, to, to kind of coach people through that. But I do, I think, I think my big feeling is like the, the what's in the code of conduct is quite good. It's more that culture. I think that Esther is talking about of like feeling like it's snitching or feeling like it's, it's too big a hammer to hit something with, you know, like it's sort of, a, it's a, it's a, an overreaction or something like that. And I feel like that's a conversation to be had across the community. My personal steer is it's better to report and have the committee say, we don't think that's a violation of the code of conduct than to not report. And then the committee really can't sort of say that it's a violation of the code of conduct if it, if it is. Um, but I think that, that maybe that's the conversation that's worth having across the community. Yes, Jim, I can see you've got your hand raised. Yeah, I think that this sounds really important. We're getting at something like quite critical there because this, the code of conduct and the process is, is sort of no use if it isn't being used by people and sort of isn't being effective. And if there aren't reports, it could either mean the community is brilliant and everyone gets along really well, or it might mean 
people aren't using it for some reason. Uh, and I suddenly reminded, uh, I don't know if anyone has, I think we often sort of talk about different types of documentation. And maybe that's a good way to look at this, that the, the code of conduct is maybe like the reference documentation is here are the rules if you need to look up specifically what's acceptable or what's not or what the process is specifically that's here maybe what we're missing is more like the user documentation or the the sort of tutorial documentation which in just sort of much simpler language says something like uh when should you uh report a potential code of conduct violation the answer is any time you were made to feel uncomfortable or you think anyone else may have been made to feel uncomfortable. And here's here's how you do it. So in very, you know, in simple terms and without the the sort of rigorous details that someone making a report doesn't really need to know. That I, I really like yeah, that sounds good. Maybe you can add this to the P to the PR that is currently going on. Actually, someone shared it before. I don't know where the link is. Uh, but Malvika was asking for suggestions and feedback, so maybe that's something to add there. It's a it's a PR, but actually, probably it's a new issue. Actually, because it's it would it probably wouldn't go into this document that's the whole point but it would reference this document yes exactly. in, a, in a much more accessible way which is really so yeah like really really good really good idea because i think once you once you read the super formal version it just make it it really elevates that feeling of like oh my goodness like i just i just didn't feel comfortable I don't necessarily want to open a legal case and there's a bridge between those two extremes right and and I think I think a, a, a sort of more constructive how to use guide and there are also other resources that exist um from communities that have that have done a lot of work in this area so the other thing that we can do with the how to use guide actually is curate examples that already exist rather than sort of reinventing our own wheel our policy needs to be implementable for us but our examples and our culture, we can learn from others and reference them and benefit from their expertise. Which sounds, I think that sounds really good. Lovely. So we've got one more minute. If anyone has anything else to say, say it now. Um, Just thank you very much, Susanna, for sharing. <laughs> well done on the timekeeping. Great job. No worries. That was fun. Um, okay. Well, I guess in that case, does anyone have any closing notes? If not, I don't know if I am debriefing with anyone if or we're just closing this and see you next time whenever that is. Why don't why don't I I'm gonna I'm gonna stop recording. Thanks everyone. Susanna, we can stay on for two minutes I don't feel we need to do a massive debrief but we'll just say thank you and goodbye to everyone but yes please enjoy your weekend I'm going to um stop recording now <laughs>